welcome to our Pleasant Hill Bible Church live stream. Uh, just a couple quick announcements before we get into the preaching time and uh, the Bible study this morning. I, <clears throat> I want to welcome any visitors that may be watching this live stream. I do want to encourage you as a visitor <clears throat> to, to be in prayer for your local congregation. Uh, to be in prayer for your local pastor, where we welcome you to hear this, uh, this live stream broadcast, but I can't encourage you and, and admonish you enough to, uh, to be prayerfully encouraging your local church family. So uh, that aside, welcome. I hope that you are blessed this morning. Welcome Pleasant Hill Bible Church uh, congregants. I miss you guys, and uh, I can't wait for us to be able to meet together next week. Next week, Lord willing, we'll be able to uh, come together. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I ask you to turn to 1 Thessalonians. That will be my text for this morning, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 4, and we will be reading verses 13 through the end of the chapter, verse number 18. I want to read this, uh, the Word of God, and then we will go to the Lord in a word of prayer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse number 13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds uh, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Bow your head with me this morning as we go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. We praise you for your word and the life-giving sustenance that it gives to us, Father. We ask that this morning you would guide my words by your Spirit. I pray that you would be with the hearers. I pray, Father, that you would strengthen us according to your truth. We worship you. Even though we are apart this morning, Lord, we worship you. Our hearts are knit together by the Spirit of, by your Spirit. We thank you for these mediums, Lord. We thank you that we can meet together like this, and we long to be with each other once more. Guide us this morning as we look to your truth in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, I've entitled this message this morning, Fearless Hope. Uh, if you would consider what's going on in the world today... Uh, I find it interesting that the Word of God, the number one command that God gives through His truth, the number one, He says this without, uh, there's no equal, there is, this is the number one command in all the Bible. He says, fear not, or do not fear. Uh, that says a lot about who God is. That tells us that He is in control and we can trust that He is in control. And the only thing that drives out fear is faith in Jesus Christ. So God tells us time and time again, fear not, do not fear. And we can take great comfort and great hope in that this morning. Uh, anxiety, fear, worry, sorrow, they plague fallen mankind. Uh, just last night, there was a thunderstorm that rolled through. And it was the first time that my little girls actually encountered a thunderstorm. Uh, the lightning flashing and the thunder booming. Uh, they, Amelia looked at me and she said, Daddy, I'm scared. And I was thinking, well, you know, it's because you don't know really what a thunderstorm is. You've never seen one before. You're, you've actually never uh, encountered what the, the product of a thunderstorm is. And you really don't know yet who created that storm and who controls that storm. Uh, so then my little girl, she was fearful of this, the storm that rolled through last night. And, and I remember back, I was thinking back to my own childhood. I remember being a child uh, a little boy, five, six years old, and thinking, I was, I was overcome with a fear that my parents were going to die. I was overcome with this fear. It, it consumed me. I remember, I remember going up to them in tears and, and fearfully telling them that, that 
I was worried that they were going to pass away because I was fearful of what would happen after that. I would never see them again. I didn't understand that those who closed their eyes in Christ in death went to be with him and we would meet again. I didn't understand that at a young age. I was overcome with a fear that this would be the end. That would be it. And as I think about today and the circus that is going on uh, outside of these walls, people are in lockdown, they're hiding, they're in their homes, and, and granted we are trying to be obedient to those in authority over us, we're trying to be wise, we're trying to be loving, loving our neighbors as ourselves, we want to, we want to bless those who have not been able to hear the word of God through these different devices, and, and, but the big question still comes in, why? Why the circus? Why are we off work? Why have we not returned to the city, to the towns? Why is everything literally shutting down before us? And it really boils down to only one thing. It's because we don't want to die. The entire world is confronted with the same truth. They are confronted with this life will end. We're confronted with our own mortality. There will be a last day. And even the, even the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, says it is appointed unto, unto man once to die, and then after this, the judgment. Death is inevitable. Now, I was surfing the internet this week, and I came across the Duck Dynasty guys, and you, you all know who they are, and, and I, we don't line up with them theologically in their entirety, but Phil Robertson said something that was pretty truthful here this week. He said, there's one thing that's certain. If there is no God, if there is no God, we are all together confronted with the same problem. We're all going to die. Eventually, it's going to happen. Whether there is or there isn't a God, whether, whether you think that there is a God or not, the same reality still exists that we are finite. There is an end. I rejoice personally. All Christians rejoice in this word. I've had some people ask me, you know, how do you know that the Bible is the word of God? How do you know that you can claim that, that this book is truly the word of God? And many other pastors have been confronted with the same question. And they, I heard one pastor answer in a most beautiful way. He was confronted with this question, how do you know that the word, that the Bible is the very word of God? And I thought that he was going to launch into this beautiful discord about all the truths in scripture that point to the fact that there is a God. I thought he was going to scan from Genesis to Revelation and point out all the magnificent truths that God proves that he exists. Or he was going to look to, at creation and say, look, you can't look outside these doors and say that there is no God. But he didn't do all that. He answered with a simple answer. An answer that I will never forget. Whenever he was asked, how do you know that the Bible is the word of God? He simply said, because I've read it. And we can say the same thing. How do you know that this is the living truth? Well, I've read it. I know that this is the word of God. It has proven itself to me. And therein, friends, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We have our faith rooted in the truth of scripture. Hear what Psalm 53 says. This is a Psalm of David. And I love what the, he begins these words. It's so point blank. These are words that we need to hear. Psalm 53 verses 1 through 5 say this. A Psalm of David. Give ear to my prayer. Psalm 53. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Corrupt are they. And have done abominable iniquity or sin. There is none that doeth good. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Every one of them is gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Question mark. Who eat up my people as they eat up bread. They have not called upon God. Verse 5 says, There were they in great fear where no fear was. I'm going to read that again. The beginning of verse 5 says, 
There were they in great fear. This is the man that says there is no God. He's, he's not just saying this with his lips. He's saying it in his heart. In his heart, he has said there is no God. This is every man that is born into the world after Adam. He says in his heart, there is no God. And they are also given in verse 5, there were they in great fear where no fear was. They were literally fearing nothing. It was something they could not see and they were fearful of it. Because in their hearts, they pursue their own iniquity. They say there is no God. This is what is remarkable about the time in which we live. This is why fallen man fears death. Because on the other side, we must meet God. We must meet our Creator. And every one of us knows that we have grievously offended Him with our sin. I want you to think about that for a minute. We have broken not only the law of God... We've crushed his heart. We've offended him. He is a loving, holy, just, good, righteous, merciful, gracious, forgiving God. And we have trampled upon his being. We say there's no God. Even though everything, history, creation, the word of God tells us that there is a loving and holy God. He is holy and we are not but it's natural. It's natural to fear death. It's natural to have a respect, an, a, a, a healthy respect of fear for death. Death is a grievous thing. When a loved one dies, it leaves a void. It's painful sorrow, grievous breaking of the heart. Those, those grievous feelings can, can last for years, and in very much a real sense, they can last a lifetime. It's the end of a life. It's the end of our existence. It's the end of someone we've deeply cared for. And, and we can't even wrap our minds around it. I like what Isaiah says in Isaiah 43. He says a remarkable thing in the first opening verses of that chapter in Isaiah 43. He says, But now thus saith the Lord that hath created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee, for I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, capital H, capital O, the Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Seba for thee. Did you catch what I, Isaiah just said there? He said, not if you go through the waters, not if the rivers rise to consume you, not if that happens, but when. He said, when you come to the fire of trial, when you come to the fires that will try to take your life, when you come to the fire of adversity, God says, I am with thee. Fear not. It's not if, it's when. So whenever we're confronted with this reality of our own mortality, it's not if, it's when, and we must Look to the one who has created us, our creator God, our loving, holy, just, righteous God, who has redeemed us through his son, Jesus Christ, our savior. What a remarkable truth. God sent a savior to save us from death, to save us from our sins, to save us from our filth. This is what Paul was addressing in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This is what Paul was talking about to the, to the believers in Thessalonica. This is so beautiful. I want to give you three points to help us understand this passage of Scripture today. As we look back at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the first point is this. A right understanding. A right understanding. The second is this. A sure hope. A sure hope. And finally... Thirdly, the only comfort, 
in life. So first, a right understanding. Do you hear, did you hear the, the heart that Paul had in, the, in these verses in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? His, his pastoral heart, his pastoral love, his care for these believers. He has now in the first three chapters of 1 Thessalonians, he has praised God for these people. He has praised God for their, their steadfast faith, their joyous heart, their love for uh, brotherly love. Paul's pastoral heart is, is easily seen in these opening chapters of 1 Thessalonians. Now, Thessalonica was a hub in Macedonia. It was a, it was a central point for trade and for commerce. It was, a, it was a hopping place. And Thessalonica was one of only a few free cities. Now, if you think of this time frame that Paul is writing in, he's talking about the Roman Empire. And to be a free city within the Roman Empire was almost unheard of. But Thessalonica in Macedonia was a free city. And the believers there are a testimony of the saving faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. These people were deeply loved by the Apostle Paul. They were faithful. They were increasing in joy. They were uh, dealing with suffering and persecution. Paul's glory, he says, you are my glory. You are my joy. And even Timothy Young Timothy, the pastor that would travel around in the Middle East, he, would, he came to the Apostle Paul praising the Thessalonian church for their faith. The faith that they had in the preached word of God. They were model believers. If you're looking for some heavy, some beautiful application on how to live your Christian life, read the first three chapters of 1 Thessalonians. But even in the midst of these people, this beautiful church in Thessalonica, even in this congregation, there was a weakness. There was, a, there was a, a weakness and a breaking in their faith. And Paul wanted to address this. He wanted to give them a right understanding of how to view death. In verses 1 through 12 of chapter 4, I want to summarize them for you. Paul teaches them how to live the Christian life. How to live as a Christian. And he also, and it's divided in two halves. The first uh, verses are, are talking about how to live, how to walk the Christian walk. Not just to talk the talk, how to walk the walk as a Christian. And the latter half of verses 1 through 12 are talking about how to live in the will of God. So the first portion of chapter 4 is to walk as a Christian. The latter half of those verses are talking about how to live in the will of God. So how to walk. How to please God. Paul goes into how to abound in love, how to abstain from fornication, to pursue sanctification, to pursue holiness, to live honorably. Now, every time the Apostle Paul says anything about living a holy life, he talks about having a love for the brethren. To live a holy life, to live in holiness, is to actually live a life of love, not only for God, Though that is our, he is our primary focus in love. He is our number one focus as we seek to aim to love God and to bring him glory. But we are also commanded as Christians not only to love God, but to love our neighbor as ourselves. If you want to live a holy life, if you want to pursue holiness and live a, a righteous life following Jesus Christ, love God, love your neighbor. And Paul says, if you look at verse number 10, he says, or verse number nine, he says, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. You say, well, how do I love my neighbor? How do I love my brother and sister in Christ? Because I'm trying to muster up everything that I have in me, and it's just hard to do. It's, if you knew this person the way I knew this person, I, you wouldn't love them either. Here's the thing. When the Holy Spirit of God comes to dwell and reside inside of you, he changes your life. Notice how Paul said, it's not you who are teaching each other how to walk in, in brotherly love, it's God. When one is regenerated by the Spirit of God and born again, love is the byproduct. Love comes as a result of this. Love is easily shown in the life of the believer because they've been changed. They are a new creature made to pursue and be molded and shaped into the image of Jesus Christ. Verse 11, I love what Paul says in verse 11, that we study to be quiet. If some of you are like, well, how do we actually live out this Christian will? How do I, what is the will of God? 
Paul goes into that in verse 11. He says, and that you study to be quiet and to do your own business, to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Did you know that the Christian should be the most industrious human being on the planet? A Christian should be able to outwork anybody because it is biblical to work with your hands. Paul elsewhere, he says, if you don't work, you don't eat. We actually see that Paul commands that you, he does three things, and, and this is interesting. He says, mind your own business, work hard, and walk honestly. That's a pretty straightforward answer on how to live the Christian life. Mind your own business, work hard, and walk honestly. Pursue the things of Jesus Christ. And some of you, if I've actually had this question be posed to me, they say, well, how do I know what the will of God is for my life? How do I know if I'm in the will of God? Can you tell me what the will of God is for my life? Here's the answer. It's very simple. Be faithful exactly where he has you until he moves you where he needs you. How do you pursue the will of God for your life? Be faithful to him where he has you until he moves you where he needs you. God is faithful, friends. Faithful is he who calls you, who also will do it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24. We have a faithful God. He is loving and just. You want to know what God's will is for your life? Be faithful. Be faithful to your family. Be faithful to your church family. Be faithful to Christ. Be faithful to the word of God. Paul goes on to say, as he starts into our text here this morning in verse 13, he says a kind of a sharp word. And remember, these are beautiful believers in Thessalonica. They're loving, they're joyful, they're pursuing faith, and they're growing in their faith, they're growing in their size. And then Paul comes in in verse 13, he says, but I wouldn't have you be ignorant. It's kind of a sharp word. Ignorant is, and he's talking about death. I don't want you to be ignorant about death. He says, I don't want you to be unaware. I don't want you to be uninformed. I don't want you to be negligent about this. I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning them which are asleep. Now, he's talking about death. He's not talking about taking a nap. He goes on to say that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. That's interesting. We need to unpack that a little bit. When Paul uses that word sorrow, he's talking about not just a simple sadness. Uh, it's not just a, a, I'm sad today and then tomorrow I'm going to be happy. He's talking about a grievous pain. He's using a word that, that, in, that, that means vexation of spirit. It's a very impactful word that Paul is saying. He says, I'm not, you shouldn't be, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those that are asleep, that you sorrow not as those that have no hope. I think of the song that I often reference by uh, Horatio Spafford. It is well with my soul. He uses, there's a line in that, in that song, that beautiful hymn, he says, when sorrow like sea billows roll. Think about that. Sometimes when you lose a loved one and it's unexpected and you just, you can't even fathom in your mind, your heart hasn't recognized what has taken place in, in reality and your ears have heard it but your heart hasn't comprehended it. It's like sorrows like sea billows roll. Horatio Spafford goes on to say, but it is well with my soul. How could he say such a thing when sorrow is overtaking him like a wave of the sea? And he says, but it is well with my soul. It's because he has the hope. He has the sure hope of Christ. Not as those who have no hope in Jesus Christ. Hope is not their first and foremost. Jesus is not their first and foremost love. So therefore they have no hope of his coming again. Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant and sorrowful like those that have no hope. Which leads us to our second point. What is this sure hope? How do we have, this isn't like a hope, like I hope it doesn't rain today. This is a sure hope. It is set. Notice what Paul says in verse 14. For if we believe, believe what? Believe the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ. If we believe, if we have faith, if we have trust, if we have given our lives to Jesus Christ, if our minds are consumed with the person and work of Christ, if you believe that Jesus died again, died and rose again, even so them also which sleep 
is Jesus, will Jesus bring with him? God will bring with him. What's he talking about? If we believe our faith, our trust in the gospel, remember, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, the Jew first and also the Greek. Jesus was risen for our justification, and he's just not talking about just simply believing that Jesus died. He's, he's talking about believing in the substitutionary, satisfactory death of Christ upon the cross. If you believe that he took your place, then those which sleep in Jesus Christ, those believers who have, who have died and gone to be with the Lord, those believers who have ceased to exist here on this earth, Jesus will bring with him. What a remarkable thought that is. He's going to bring those dead loved ones of the Thessalonians. He's going to bring our beloved friends with him. If, the, if this takes place today, those in Christ who have gone on before us, they will come in the clouds. They will come. Their souls will come. They will meet their resurrected bodies. Verse 15, for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Interesting side note here. Paul lays claim to actually being inspired by the Spirit of God, that the words that he is speaking and writing are actually the words of God. By dual inspiration, he is actually being inspired by the Spirit of God, and yet Paul is penning these words, which lays truth to 13 of the books of your New Testament, which Paul has penned. He's speaking the Word of God. There is going to be an un uninhibited resurrection of all dead believers. Look at verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain that would be us like right now unto the coming of the Lord shall not prove